Good morning. Thank you all so much for attending this morning's conversation with Dr. Lee Williams, author of We Who Believe in Freedom, The Life and Times of Ella Baker. Ella Baker was a civil rights activist and a graduate from one of our own HBCUs, Shaw University. We would also like to thank the research room for sharing your space with us this morning. Today's conversation will be moderated by Sheila Carroll, graphic designer with the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. The Government and Heritage Library is so honored that Dr. Williams will be introduced by Dr. Valerie Johnson, the chair of the African American Heritage Commission and Bennett College professor. Please give a round of applause to Dr. Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you, glad to be here, and thank you so much for that wonderful um, introduction. I am very pleased and honored to be able to introduce Lee Williams, Dr. Lee E. Williams, <laughs> to you today. Um, we met each other maybe several years ago mm -hmm. and have been in contact back and forth, and I can tell you that she has graciously um, honored our class with being able to come to visit Bennett College's class. It's a course on gender, race, and activism on Wednesday, mm -hmm. the 20th. And there the students have been reading the book, We Who Believe in Freedom. And so it would be interesting to see their take on the book. And they've been charged with doing a lesson plan for middle college students. We have a middle college, middle high school students mm -hmm. there at Bennett. So with all that being said, <laughs> let me introduce Lee formally. Dr. Williams is an author, educator, and teacher who began her career teaching with grade, teaching sixth grade in Milwaukee, then moved into higher education administration at the United Negro College Fund headquarters in New York City. And that is a wonderful story if you get a chance to hear that. She relocated to Greensboro, North Carolina as an administrator at Bennett College. Williams organized and directed the National African American Women's Leadership Institute, a leadership program for women focused on community service. And we still have remnants of your um, tenure at Bennett College in our new kind of revision women's leadership program. So we're drawing on the shoulders, on your shoulders. Currently, she teaches English to speakers of other languages, ESOL, at Guilford Technical Community College. Dr. Williams is the author of three books and dozens of articles on education. Her books include Servants of the People, the 1960s Legacy of African American Leadership, which profiles individuals who were prominent in the 1960s civil rights movement. Her newest book, We Who Believe in Freedom, The Life and Times of Ella Baker, is a juvenile biography for middle school and high school students. Competitively selected, We Who Believe in Freedom is the second in a series, True Tales for Young Readers, published by the North Carolina Office of Archives and History. In 2019, the Baker Biography received a Making Digital Progress Award from the Library Journal. In community service, Dr. Williams has served as president of the Friends of the Greensboro Public Library and on the boards of numerous nonprofit organizations, including the Community Foundation of Greater Greensboro, Greensboro Community TV, and the Greensboro History Museum. I am pleased to introduce Lee Williams. Thank you for coming out this morning. It's great to see everybody. Uh, you've already had your introduction, mm -hmm. so let's get right to it. Good. Okay. Um, Ella Baker was born in 1903. Mm -hmm. She is a powerful speaker, was a powerful speaker, speaker and organizer regarding social justice causes. Can you describe Ella Baker's childhood and how it nurtured her sense of curiosity. I am delighted to be here and thank you Valerie for such a fulsome and gracious <laughs> introduction. And Sheila has a special place in my heart because she helped immensely with the design of this book, especially the cover, which I love. So thank you for that. Um, Ella Baker, 
uh, I'm always delighted to talk about her because through biography, I think we get to know people in a very special way. And uh, Ella Baker was one of those behind the scenes people mm -hmm. during the civil rights movement. And she didn't always get a lot of credit uh, for what she did. Uh, she was a woman and this was a ve very male dominated movement. But her upbringing uh, uh, in her family and in her community taught her a lot about how to push herself forward in explaining to others the positions that she took. So um, she was not one who was necessarily recognized by the male civil rights leaders, but she was a behind the scenes workhorse in the movement. Mm -hmm. And how did that come about? It came about through her family, really, and the upbringing that she had. Her parents were one generation from slavery. Her grandparents had been uh, enslaved and um, they were emancipated. They learned um, her maternal grandparents to read and write and that made a critical difference in what they were able to do once they were out of slavery. Her paternal grandparents had a different route because they were not literate, did not know how to read or write. So they ended up actually staying on the plantation where uh, they had been enslaved and working as tenant farmers. But Ella Baker's maternal grandparents were actually able to acquire land, about 50 acres of land, and so they prospered more. So that's background to help you understand Ella Baker because her parents heard stories from their parents about the brutality, the limitations of being slaves. And those were stories that were part of the family lure. And what did that mean for Ella Baker? It meant that she grew up in a household where her parents very much valued education. Hard work was a virtue that was preached all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they uh, really pushed the children, and there were three of them, to excel in school. There was an older brother, uh, then Ella was in the middle, and a younger sister. And before they even went to school, uh, their mother, Anna, had taught them to read and to write and to speak. <laughs> um, they went to a small church school because um, public education in the South uh, was very poor. The quality of it was poor for both uh, whites and uh, African Americans. Mm -hmm. But this was a church-related school that they went to. And then because Ella Baker was recognized as being the smartest of the three students, she went on to uh, Shaw Academy. But she grew up in this very nurturing household uh, with parents and grandparents who frankly doted on her. <laughs> and uh, she developed a lot of self-confidence as a young child. And I think you see the how that influenced everything that she did. And as she stepped out into the world, she took that confidence with her. Mm -hmm. But she grew up in that kind of environment with those values. And um, her grandfather on her mother's side had a nickname for her. He called her the Grand Lady. Mm -hmm. And when she was very young, six or seven years of age, um, they would have very adult conversations. He talked with her and to her uh, as though she was an adult. And um, that encouraged her self-confidence. So uh, she uh, was his favorite and everyone knew that. Uh, but uh, she grew up in this very loving environment uh, at home. And I think they stimulated her to, uh, to be curious about the world around her. Mm -hmm and uh, to read 
uh, to be comfortable speaking uh, in public, in fact. And so that was her background that sort of gave her the courage to move into the world. I see. Mm -hmm. So we know that academically she excelled and then that also helped her succeed even further with her uh, education as she went to Shaw right down the street from here. Yes. So as I was doing research on this, can you talk about, uh, so she went to high school at Shaw, at Shaw Academy. Right, mm -hmm. at Shaw Academy, mm -hmm. and then she went further to, to Shaw University. University. Mm -hmm. Now Shaw Academy does not exist. It does today. not exist today. No. Many of the uh, historically black colleges had high school divisions um, because, as I mentioned, the quality of the public education, it was almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. So the, the colleges often had high school divisions. Some of them even had elementary schools. Ella went to Shaw Academy at the age of 14, so she right. was sort of entering high school. And then she stayed on and went to the university and um, majored there uh, at the university and graduated. So she left home, mm -hmm. Littleton, which is sort of on the border of North Carolina and Virginia. <laughs> um, she came to this area of mm -hmm. the country um, as a boarding student went to high school, did well there, went on uh, to pursue her undergraduate four-year degree, graduated as the valedictorian of the class, and um, was something of an outspoken student. In fact, in high school, some of the college students came to her and asked her if she would go to the Dean of Women. And back in the day, <laughs> the Dean of Women, I don't know if when you went to school, the Dean of Women was as powerful a position as it was with Ella Baker, <laughs> but you lived in fear of being called into that office. Um, when I went to Kentucky State, a land-grant institution back in the day, in the 60s, you didn't want to be in that dean of students office uh, to be called in for anything. So these were very powerful positions. Well, the, the college students, the women, approached Ella Baker and they said, would you go uh, to the dean and would you make a case for us? Because we know you are well spoken, you won't be intimidated by this dean. And uh, we would like for you to put forward our position. Now, what was the issue? These young women wanted to be allowed to wear silk stockings on right. campus. <laughs> now, you know, we laugh about that today because can you get students out of their jeans today <laughs> to say nothing of stockings? I mean, well, that's, we don't want even those of us who grad, we don't, pantyhose and all of that no longer. They wanted to be able to wear silk stockings. So I can kind of imagine these students in those, if you've seen the pictures, they probably had the socks on with shoes that, you know, that they wore around campus. But they wanted to wear silk stockings. And this was in the 1920s. And so what they were seeing out in society, you know, the flappers and all of that, so they wanted to be a little more contemporary. So they asked Ella Baker, would you go and talk to the Dean of Women? And she did. She went and she made her case. She had a couple of meetings with the Dean. And the story that's told is that she was so forceful in presenting her case to this Dean of Women that it surprised the Dean she was not accustomed to students coming and presenting their case. And it's said that she was so forceful in one meeting that the dean of women fainted to the floor. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but she did not change. But before Ella Baker graduated from college, they had changed uh, that, yes, that rule that the women could not wear silk stockings on campus, so they had relaxed the dress code somewhat. Now that was one of about three times that are recorded where Ella Baker challenged authority 
Another instance uh, was um, when she, they, she was about to graduate. She was a senior in college at that point. And um, a Bible uh, course was required of students. And the students in a particular professor's class objected to the way the test was going to be administered because the other faculty allowed students to use their notes to take the exam. This one professor did not. So the students said, we're not going to take the test. <laughs> they were going to boycott the exam. Uh, they presented their case. Well, I think some parents probably got in touch with these seniors and said, yes, you are going to take it. You've been there four years. You're going to graduate. So they relented and they did take that test. But the one, the third incident was when the president, right. who was the last white president, often the historically black colleges had Caucasian presidents mm -hmm. were the first ones. It was only later that African Americans became presidents of the institutions. Um, he, uh, when there were northern visitors coming to campus, um, he would often request that the students would sing for these dignitaries but he wanted them to sing Negro spirituals. And you might know that Fisk University was famous. Its choir went around the world, in fact, singing and raising money for the institution. Well, some of the students didn't particularly like that they were being asked to sing only spirituals. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when the president asked Ella if she would lead a song, she very politely forcefully and directly said, no, Mr. President, I will not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she did not. So she was outspoken from the beginning. Uh, she graduated from Shaw with a lot of confidence. Like s most young people, she was ready to go out and face the world and very idealistic in what she hoped to and accomplish. And as a valedictorian. Yes, Again, yes. as you mentioned before. Yes, valedictorian of her class. Mm -hmm. So she was ready to tackle the world. So she did not stay in North Carolina. No. She moved. She went she to moved New to Jersey. York. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure her mother and father were happy that she moved in with relatives in New Jersey. And uh, she did what most young people do. You know, she um, went out looking for a job. Mm -hmm. She graduated in 1927. Um, and uh, she just pounded the pavement to try to find uh, some, some work to do. And she wor worked as a waitress initially uh, at a resort. And she said she encountered all kinds of people, probably the most diverse group of people that she had encountered up to that point. And she learned a lot about people. And she said how to read them. Um, uh, so she did that and finally got enough money to move to New York, to Harlem, and uh, get her own place and, again, look for work because mm -hmm. it, it, throughout Ella Baker's life, she never had a lot of money. She never sought positions where she would necessarily make a lot of money. Um, she wanted to do good over uh, making money. Uh, so she worked odd jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, but she met wonderful people because the Harlem branch of the New York City Public Library was a meeting place for intelligent, young, black uh, men and women who wanted to change the world. Mm -hmm. And they would meet there. So she met people who were lifelong friends. Also, in addition to the library, the YWCA and the YMCA were places where uh, people uh, congregated and met. Uh, so she hung out at those institutions. And um, she worked, met friends, and enjoyed herself in, in New York. And, um, and some of those friends were Dorothy Height, right. Polly Murray. Yes, they became. A, probably more well known during their lifetimes than maybe Ella Baker, but they were lifelong friends mm -hmm. uh, for her. Now, finally, um, 
she got uh, work that paid a little bit more. Uh, and one of the jobs was the, um, which was the first one, this young, was it the young? Young Negro Cooperative. Young Negroes. Negro Cooperative League. League. And what was that? Well, this was, uh, by this time, the height of the De Great Depression. And Ella Baker and the young people around her, her friends, could see people suffering, uh, especially in Harlem. You know, there were long soup lines. There were homeless families. Mm -hmm. There were people who would go through garbage cans to try to find food to eat. And so George Schuyler was a very well-known African-American journalist. And uh, these young people were in his circle. He uh, talked about uh, social activism. And so they had the idea to form this cooperative. And it worked like cooperatives do today. People would buy shares in the cooperative. Mm -hmm. They would do all of the work. <laughs> you know, they would uh, uh, fill the shelves and they would ring up the, the purchases. Um, so they would buy food in bulk and then the people who were members of the club would purchase it at reduced prices. They had that in Harlem and then they were starting them all over the country. And Ella Baker was the first director of the co cooperative. And she worked very hard as always. Any job that she took on, she took it on with uh, a great deal of seriousness. It only lasted two years. Uh, but in that time, you begin to see the stamp that Ella Baker puts on any organization or program that she's a part of. What did that mean? It meant that she had people participating. Uh, she, it was not top down. She was always encouraging people to be the leaders in their communities and in their organizations. So it was a very democratic style of leadership. Um, she was concerned that people who could pay and uh, might uh, have more of the um, co-op um, shares mm -hmm. than others. If you had more money, you could have more shares. But she said, it doesn't matter how many shares you're able to buy. Everybody has one vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if I had 10, I didn't have any more say than you mm -hmm. if you had only one. <clears throat> uh, but they had one vote. And she made sure in the cooperatives that the women's voices were not silent and that the young people had a voice as well. And these were kind of hallmarks of any program that Ella Baker ran or was involved in from that time on. Uh, so uh, uh, they had this cooperative. It lasted for about two years, mm -hmm. uh, but she was director of it. So again, you see this leadership. She ha was always recognized for her leadership ability, and she became very skillful in organizing people. Uh, so wherever she went, that was sort of a trademark of of, of, of her success mm -hmm. in, in organizations. Great. Mm -hmm. So she also, we can see her, her love for young people, even in the Young People's Forum at the Harlem Branch Library. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1934. Mm -hmm. And that was about four years after the cooperative. This was a program that was more an idea in the minds of the people at the library. And they gave it to Ella Baker. They hired her, gave it to her, and told her to go forth and do great things with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's exactly what she was able to do. Because she, um, having valued education all of her life, mm -hmm. she brought that to the program. Mm -hmm. She exposed the youth in Harlem to people in their community who were prominent. She had them come and speak. She introduced the students to great books for them to read. 
she sponsored programs for them so that they had some vision of what was going on in the larger world. When I went to um, New York to go to graduate school in the early 70s, one of the things that surprised me was that even then, and I went to Teachers College Columbia, which was right on the cusp of Harlem, mm -hmm. um, that some of the students and young people in Harlem never got beyond their neighborhoods. You know, you think of jumping on the subway or the, a, a bus and you can get to Fifth Avenue. They stayed right in those neighborhoods. You can imagine in the 30s, there were young people who had not ventured beyond their neighborhood in Harlem. She took them beyond that. They saw a larger world. Um, so they had that exposure. And then she did something else that was a little unique for organizations then and as well as today. She invited other organizations to be part of the programs. So she had the, she had outreach to other organizations. She didn't see them necessarily as being competitors. Mm -hmm. She would invite them to be part of her programs, which strengthened what she was doing. And so that program uh, became a kind of signature program for the library. And it was because of Ella Baker and what she was able to do with the, with the program. So then she took those same qualities. And in 1940, she became the assistant field secretary for the National Office of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. And then in 43, three years later, she became national director of all of the branches to go from three years to assistant field secretary to director mm -hmm. of all branches in the country says something in mm -hmm. itself. But what you've also touched on, and I'm sure is what she's bringing in, is the sense of autonomy and the group-centered approach mm -hmm. to all of her, uh, that's her signature style. Mm -hmm. So how did she go about doing this? I mean, that's admirable. Mm -hmm. Especially <laughs> with, with, with right, the NAACP. Again, these were male-dominated civil rights organizations, and the NAACP was just the granddaddy of them all. Mm -hmm. And they pretty much uh, decided how programs were going to go in the branches. It's very top-down leadership. And Ella Baker was just the opposite. She wanted it to bubble up from the, mm -hmm. the grassroots. I don't know necessarily where she saw that that worked well the very first time, mm -hmm. but she knew that was the, the, the way things worked best. And probably it was because she learned to listen to people. Mm -hmm. So when she would go to the branches, and yes, having this job as the national director of branches across the country, meant that she knew all of these uh, NAACP branches. And she traveled to them because the NAACP is a membership organization as it is today. It depends on people joining. They get dues and they're able to, uh, to uh, plan and execute programs from those funds. Mm -hmm. They also send a portion to the national office as well. So having members is key. And Ella Baker was just very good at uh, helping the branches to increase their memberships. Um, when she went in, mm -hmm. she didn't take necessarily the programs from the national office. She would go to a branch, she would identify those people who were natural leaders, she would listen to what they had to say, how they wanted to grow the membership, and then she would help them do that. Okay. Uh, so she listened. And then an important part of any program that she ran was to develop the skills that people needed because she wanted them to have skills that remained in the community through these grassroots leaders so that when the NAACP person left, the skills didn't go with them. They were there in the community. Um, so she would always have a leadership 
workshop component mm -hmm. to whatever okay. she was doing. She listened to what people wanted to do, and she let that guide the programs that they developed. She would go into unconventional places. Now, the NAACP, all right, it's this organization that has a certain way of doing programs. They also fought for rights for African Americans in the courts so that they didn't really initially even like what Martin Luther King was doing because he had black people out in the streets marching. They thought that was rather undignified. You bring a case to the court, and the NAACP had been doing that since the 30s, and you build uh, case law, and that's how you get to 54 with the Brown decision. So here's the NAACP. Ella Baker is working for it. They would go into a community, they would meet in a church. Uh, Ella Baker went into the community, she would meet at the barber shop. She would go to the pool room, she went to the bar, she would go to the beauty sh uh, shop. They thought that was just undignified, but she knew that's where they would find, she would find the people, mm -hmm. she would find the leaders. And those were the people in that community that other people would listen to. She was able to grow the membership uh, many fold. And so while people may have been a little bit reluctant for her to come into the community, when they saw the results, they were really very happy and very pleased with uh, what she was able to do. There's a wonderful story of the head of the NAACP at, uh, in Richmond, Virginia. He wrote to Walter White, who was head of the NAACP. He said, we are about to launch a statewide membership campaign. We need some help. Would you please send us someone? And Walter White knew that Ella Baker would be the best person to go. She had the skills. She had been successful. So he wrote back and he said, Ella Baker is coming to help you. And the head of the Richmond NAACP got very nervous. He said, I think a young man would be better <laughs> because this person will have to travel throughout the state I cannot guarantee the accommodations that will be made available because often, you know the green book, right? You know, there were no, not even motel aid or, you know, where African Americans could stay. So they stayed in people's homes. So they said, he said, I don't know where she'll be lodged. She might be going uh, to places that are very isolated. And I don't, you know, I'm concerned about her safety. Well, Walter White wrote back, he said, she's on her way, you know, so she's, <laughs> she'll be there. Well, Ella Baker arrived. By the end of that campaign, I think they had nine times the number of members wow. that they had had before. This director uh, of the Richmond branch wrote a letter to Walter White lauding Ella. Oh, she was his newest best friend. <laughs> he just praised her to the hilt. She had done a wonderful job. And what had she done? Well, yes, nine times the membership. But he, said, he spoke to things like she immediately won the trust of people in the community. And that's how she was able to increase the membership. So she would go in. People were often skeptical. They were often men. There was so much sexism in these organizations. She had to fight, as did all of the other women in the organizations, to have a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, but she proved herself through hard work, persistence, determination, and always the bottom line for Ella Baker was, what are the results? Mm -hmm. And she got results. And so we know when you get results, people kind of have to respect you. You gain their respect. And so she was able to do that. Well, that is true. Very, she did earn the respect. Although the, there's one section of your book that you wrote that many people thought 
and it was probably because she went against the grain and mm -hmm. she did have an unconventional approach, which I loved. They said she was difficult. Mm -hmm. Yes. Difficult. Women were difficult. Yes. I you love know, that. Yes. <laughs> because we, we have those words that describe women today, and you know, they're more positive when it's a male. Oh, he's assertive and gets the job mm -hmm. done. She's difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, Ella Baker said, all right, you can say that I'm difficult. I recognize those uh, aspects of my personality. But if being difficult means that I don't necessarily ingratiate myself to people who are in leadership positions, I'll accept that. I want to get something done. And it was not only men, though, who said Ella Baker was difficult. There were women who said she was difficult. Mm -hmm. And she was because she was outspoken. If she saw something that she thought was not right, uh, that you were not working hard, in, she would let you know face to face that that's what she thought. Here's a way that you might do it uh, in a better way. She didn't mince words. And so that sometimes went against the grain and rubbed people the wrong way. Um, so she owned that <laughs> part of her personality. Uh, I had the wonderful opportunity two years ago to meet her grand niece, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Carolyn Brockington. And as an aside, I'll tell you this family lore. Ella Baker adopted her sister, Maggie, who was the third child and the youngest, adopted her daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, she went to New York to live with, live with Ella Baker. And um, Baker uh, just, she raised her. Mm -hmm. And Jackie Brockington mm -hmm. was her niece. Yes. And she married, had a daughter, Carolyn Brockington, who was Ella Baker's grand niece. <clears throat> and I met her two years ago because there is an Ella Baker Day in Littleton, uh, North Carolina. And uh, Dr. Brockington, Carolyn Brockington, uh, has been spearheading getting the uh, home place in Littleton renovated. And uh, she's a wonderful, so many characteristics of Ella Baker, an unassuming person who heads the stroke center at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Wow. She heard her grand uh, aunt uh, talking about what she perhaps had wanted to do uh, herself. She said, oh, I wished I could have studied medicine. But uh, she couldn't. And she said that no medical school would accept her. I kind of, now, this would have been in really? 27. And huh. I, I imagine it would have been difficult to get into one. I also wondered about just the financing of it, you know, for mm -hmm. her. But she said she, that would have been something that she would have liked to have pursued. Hmm. And so uh, Carolyn Brockington grew up hearing these stories, and she said she said to her grand aunt one day, I think I might like to go into medicine. Do you think I could do that? And she said, I think you could do anything that Absolutely. you set your heart and mind mm -hmm. to do it. And so the fact that she became a doctor, I thought it took two generations to get to that, but, you right. know, it succeeded. And she is. She's so unassuming. Uh, when we go to, and my sister and I went to uh, the first Ella Baker Day, and we saw her then last year at the, she greeted us like we were family. I mean, she was just, she's the most wonderful person. And she talks uh, about the stories, uh, shares stories of what she learned from her aunt. Uh, and it's wonderful. So it brought it to Ella Baker really to life. And she didn't see her as difficult. Oh, she didn't see her as difficult. No, she did not see her. She was a loving yes. grand aunt to oh, her. Sure she mm -hmm. was. That's wonderful. Okay, I'm going to have to read this, so pardon me. I don't just don't want to make sure that I don't get this wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, Ella Baker was part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and 
can you talk about her involvement coordinating, and here's where I have to read this, the logistics at the prayer pil pilgrimage, pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. for freedom at the Lincoln Memorial on May 17th, 1957. Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you the background of how mm -hmm. she got involved. Mm -hmm. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was the organization that Martin Luther King and other ministers uh, wanted to create. They didn't know what the name was going to be. They knew that after the Montgomery bus boycott was so successful mm -hmm. that they wanted to continue that kind of initiative. And so they asked two men, Bayard Rustin and uh, Stanley Levins, uh, Levin, Levison, a Jewish lawyer who was very close to King. Uh, Rustin was a, an organizer who had, uh, was recognized for his organizational skills. And so King asked them if they would think about how this movement could be continued through a formal organization. And they knew right away that the third person they needed to be part of this was Ella Baker. Mm -hmm. And so they had to approach King. They couldn't just invite her to be part of it. <laughs> you know, the men who were in charge of these organizations, you had to pass everything through them. You didn't make decisions on your own. So he, they said to uh, King, they approached uh, uh, Dr. King and said, well, we want to bring Ella Baker into this. He was reluctant to have a woman involved mm -hmm. in this um, his organization, what was going to be his. But they, they said she's got the skills and she's got the networks because she's worked throughout the South mm -hmm. through the NAACP. So mm -hmm. he relented and he said, okay. Well, she helped them draw up, the three of them drew up the blueprint for what became the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And um, she ran, she was the first paid staff person. Right. She ran the office. She did the programs and this prayer vigil was the first major event they were to have. It was on the third anniversary, anniversary of the Brown decision. It was mm -hmm. in 54. It was March, May 17, 1957, mm -hmm. three years after Brown. And it was not really clear what their objectives were. You know, they just knew it would be nice to be in Washington, D.C., to uh, meet in the nation's capital, to bring people together around civil rights organizations, but they hadn't really outlined clearly the objectives. Ella Baker went ahead, she worked on it, and got uh, some 25 to 30,000 people to come out on that day. <laughs> King made a uh, major moving speech. Mm -hmm. He was invited by Vice President Nixon um, to meet with him later. And uh, as a result, and we think of civil rights acts as probably being the uh, 1964 and 65 uh, acts, but they were trying to pass civil rights acts for a number of decades, and in 57, there was one that had been pending in Congress that was finally passed after this prayer vigil okay. and the work that was done toward that, because one of the things King said to Nixon is that we need to get this Civil Rights Act passed, and so they did. So some good things came out of that, and Ella Baker was the one who organized it. Mm -hmm. Now, she was doing all of the staff work. She was doing the programming. They decided, okay, it's now time for us to have um, a director. Mm -hmm. And so they went out and conducted a search. They never once thought about having Ella Baker fill that position. Uh, they hired someone. The person came in and I think was there for less than a year. It was not a good fit. They hired a minister. These ministers, you know, their <laughs> network was always minister. So they hired someone. And the person wanted to, I think he was from Virginia, he wanted to stay to keep his church and to try to run the organization as well. Mm -hmm. Didn't do a good job. So he left in short order. They instituted a second search. They made Ella Baker the interim director, but again, she was never considered for that position. So they hired another man to, uh, uh, to be the director. 
Yet they asked her if she would help with this citizens campaign, which was another major event that they wanted to have. It was to uh, launch this citizenship uh, campaign to get African Americans to vote. They announced it in October and they wanted to have it in March. So she had about six months to pull this all together. And again, she was successful because she had this wide network of do in, in doing that. But um, their programs were usually a success because of her. But she was seen as, you know, you're behind the scenes working. Mm -hmm. You do all the grunt work. <laughs> um, the men will be out front. And uh, it was hard to organize things at that time. There weren't, there wasn't email. Uh, you couldn't text anybody. Right. That's you right. You didn't have the instant gratification that you do now. Exactly. You had to write a letter and mm -hmm. put a stamp on it and mail it out. And right. Hope that it comes. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> it was much harder. And long six distance ta phone Six months calls is not a long time. It's not a long time. Right. Were expensive. You know, it was just, yes. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And so that was a lot. Uh, to accomplish in mm. a very short time. Yes. So, so that was... Um, she made it happen. She did. She <laughs> made it happen. But you know, whenever Ella Baker uh, worked at an organization like the NAACP and NCLC, she worked hard, but at, there at a point, and this is where the difficult came in, if she got fed up, she would leave. <laughs> and it didn't matter that she didn't have a lot of money in the bank. She just decided these folks are not going in the direction that I think they should be. The way they are, they organize their programs and what they want to do. I don't think it's it's um, it's efficient. It's mm -hmm. effective, and so I'm just going to look for a next thing to do. Greener pastures, mm -hmm. and she would do that. Which really led as uh, SNCC is that? I was just the next <laughs> thing. So <laughs> because. I think if, if you ask Ella Baker, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent non Coordinating Committee, Committee, was probably the organization that she loved best because it was a student organization. Now, she was still at SCLC February 1, 1960, when four students from uh, North Carolina College decided they would walk downtown to the <coughs> Woolworth store. They went in, they purchased a few uh, supplies, had their receipt, they took it to the lunch counter, they sat down and they tried to order coffee. The uh, waitresses said, we cannot serve you. They said, well, we purchased other goods in the store. We've spent our money. Why can't we sit down and eat? So, you know, that led to what spread like wildfire throughout the South among college students. Mm -hmm. These sit-ins. They were not, th 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 the 60s sit-in at the Woolworth was not the first. There had been sit-ins going back to the 40s, but that was the one that caught on. Some students at Howard University in 43-44 had conducted a sit-in. The president quickly got them to shut that down. <laughs> Often presidents were really under a lot of pressure from uh, people in the community. If it was a, pri if it was a public school uh, like an A&T, they would, legislators would say, you've got to get this under control. You know, your funding is at stake in this. So uh, they often would um, get the students to uh, shut down before any real gains were made. But the February 1, 1960 in Greensboro was very effective. It spread to other colleges. And the people at NAACP and NCLC they looked around, they saw these young people, they said, well, they're not part of us. What's going on? And they were effective. Uh, Roy Wilkins, who was at that time head of the NAACP, he said, who are these young people? He said, you can't tell them anything because they had been in touch with them, you know. 
they, uh, they don't listen to adults. They do what they want to do. Uh, and uh, they were kind of outraged at these young people. They tried to get them to organize under the NAACP, under SCLC, but um, they weren't buying into that. Ella Baker was looking and she got in touch with the leaders. She said, well, they've been effective with these sit-ins, but these are young people. I don't think they necessarily have the leadership skills to keep this going. They may not understand the philosophy and history of the movement. They just knew that they were sick and tired <laughs> of not being able to go to the lunch counter. Mm -hmm. um, so she contacted them and they sat in February 1. She convened a conference at Shaw <laughs> uh, in April during the spring break. She got the SCLC, King's Organization, to provide $800 to underwrite this conference. She asked Dr. King if he would uh, sign the letter of invitation mm -hmm. and, would speak. and speak, and he agreed to do that. Uh, she thought, well, maybe we'll get 100 students. They ended up getting, I think, 300 who came from all over. They were able to network. Um, to get to know one another, to uh, map out strategies for how they would go the next step. And um, Ella Baker said, you might not necessarily want to join, come in under the umbrella of NAACP or SCLC. Why don't you think about forming your own organization? And so they met again a second time in May in Atlanta at the SCLC headquarters. And that's when they decided to form their own organization, the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And um, Baker was one who, she was in her mid-50s when the uh, SNCC was founded. She was working with college students who were, what, 17 to 21. John Lewis, mm -hmm. Congressman Lewis, who has served the 5th District of uh, Georgia in the House for some 33 years, was a college student. Mm -hmm. He uh, was an activist. He was part of the Freedom Rides, was beaten and bloodied. He said uh, Ella Baker was the oldest person in the room at their meetings, but she was the youngest in terms of ideas. And he remembers that Baker would sit in the back at a meeting. She would let the young people lead the meeting. If they got stuck, she might pose a question that would draw them out. She did not take over the leadership. And uh, they developed their leadership skills. They developed the passion for social justice issues. You have uh, John Lewis. You had um, Julian Bond. Mm -hmm. Julian Bond, uh, he left Morehouse in his senior year to become the communications director for SNCC. He later went back and finished, but um, he, he served in the Georgia House of Representatives, the Georgia Senate, and for over 10 years, he was the national president of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. So um, Eleanor Holmes Norton mm -hmm. was a graduate of Yale Law School. She volunteered for the N, uh, SNCC for SNCC. Women, uh, other women, Diane Nash was an undergraduate student at Fisk. She was from Chicago, and when she got to Nashville and she saw how segregated the society was, she was outraged about that. So she led Freedom Rides from Nashville. She uh, went to training workshops to learn about nonviolent techniques. She became a leader in SNCC as well. 
So these were young people. Bob Moses was one of Ella's uh, uh, children, <laughs> uh, young people. He got a, I think, a MacArthur Genius mm -hmm. Award, started the Algebra Project to get high schools to encourage African-American students mm -hmm. to take algebra, which is a gatekeeper for other math courses. Right. Right. And when you go to college, mm -hmm. if you want to be in one of the technical or scientific fields, you have to have strong math skills. Mm -hmm. So there were these seeds that were planted in young people and, that she mentored. And so she was an advocate for the organization, which she was a friend and mentor to those young people. And I think that was her heart. Yes. She really enjoyed doing that. And we can see connections of that in uh, the Young People's Forum when she was part of their branch library. All in of a sudden Harlem. it's coming. Full circle. Full circle mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. So my final question is, uh, you said she was in her latter 50s. Mm -hmm. So uh, in her later years, she still remained active in she social did. causes. Um, can you please explain some of those? Mm -hmm. um, she um, was in New York and while while she had retired from mm -hmm. full-time working, she still kept her hand in. She worked um, with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which had been founded by Fannie Lou Hamer and some other activists in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. She was also part of the campaign to free Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she kept her hand in very much in social justice causes uh, throughout her life. She um, suffered from dementia in her later years. She uh, died in 1986. Uh, she died uh, on December 13, which was her birthday <laughs> in uh, 1986 um, at the age of 83. And the apartment that she had in New York, if you know anything about New York and apartments, her grand niece, Dr. Brockington, mm -hmm. lives in that same apartment. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, because you know, rent stabilized mm -hmm. and rent yeah. controlled. And people get in those apartments and they stay forever. Mm -hmm. So she, her grand niece, is in that very same apartment in, in Harlem. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. So she was active right to the very end. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to talk about Baker. I always enjoy that, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. If anybody has any questions, <coughs> please feel free. Pipe up. <laughs> There's one. I have a question. I just want to thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, thank you for your time and your energy today. In addition, I really appreciated how um, you captured Ella Baker as an organizer. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes when we hear about her, it's simply within the context of the movement. But mm -hmm. um, she was so much more yeah, for um, her entire life, right? Exactly. Before and yes. after. So so thank you for thank you uh, for that comment. blessing us with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know I'm gonna have a question. Please, <laughs> please, please. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about um what got you first interested in mm -hmm. Ella Baker and a little bit about your process of writing and gathering the research about okay. her. Oh I'd be happy to. Um Sheila mentioned the first book I wrote, which um, Servants of the People, the 1960s Legacy of African American Leadership. It came out in 1996. I used secondary sources to do the research on the people in that first book. Mm -hmm. I looked for scholarly biographies of them, and there were other materials. Well, in the 1990s, there were very few books that captured the role and lives of women in the movement. 
Fannie Lou Hamer, who was very active in Mississippi, quite a bit had been written about her. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't find any other biographies in 1995 when I was doing the research, except for Fannie Lou Hamer. Well, fast forward to uh, 2008, I guess, is when I discovered biographies for Ella Baker and Septima Clark. Mm -hmm. Septima Clark, if you've seen that wonderful picture book of, of African American women, Septima Clark is on the cover of it, um, Civil Rights Icons, and you can look in any library and find it. Well, she worked in South Carolina, taught school at a time when if you were a member of the NAACP, they outlawed people being part of any civil rights organization in law. <laughs> Subversive organizations, if you were a school teacher, you couldn't be part of it. And that mm -hmm. NAACP was considered to be subversive. Well, Septa McClark was an officer in the NAACP, and she didn't hide the fact, so they fired her. <laughs> And uh, it took her 20 years to get her pension reinstated. What? But she went off and she ran citizenship schools for NAACP and SCLC. She'd go throughout the South teaching blacks who had usually uh, maybe very little education, how you even filled out a paper ballot. Well, those two women, there were biographies. So I asked if um, I could update the book and include those so that I ended up, the first book had six leaders, one of whom, Fannie Lou Hamer, female. Uh, the updated version had eight because I added Ella and Septima Clark. Mm -hmm. So um, I had heard about Ella, I knew her name, but I had no idea how much she had done. Mm -hmm. And so that's what captured me about her. <clears throat> and. Um, the research is just reading as much as possible about uh, the people in the book. And the only one I actually met of the, the eight people in the second, uh, the second edition of Servants of the People was Dr. Fred Patterson, who founded the United Negro College Fund. And he was still active when I went to work at the College Fund. <laughs> so I actually got to know him a little. But the other people I had to depend on the uh, scholarly sources. Now I will say today what is wonderful, and you know, uh, writers go to the, the original documents mm -hmm. and so you've got to have some money to be able to travel from research library to research library. But so much has been digitized these days that you can do a lot of your research online. And the latest project or subject that I'm interested in is black women in journalism during the civil rights period because there were a couple of outstanding black women journalists. And um, I was so happy to find that, and I'm looking at black newspapers because there was a time when black newspapers were in every community. I grew up in the small town of Paducah, Kentucky, which is on the Ohio River mm -hmm. right across from Illinois. Mm -hmm. My hometown back in that day had two black newspapers. Well, many of those uh, newspapers have been digitized and you can find, I think there are close to 500 newspapers that are now online. So you can sit at home and do a lot of the research now into these original documents, which you couldn't, I couldn't even in 19, the 1995 era. So that's been wonderful. As you're speaking about the newspaper women, there's um, Delilah Beasley is someone from Oakland, California, and who was an editor and newspaper, um, owner of a newspaper out there. So mm -hmm. that would, in a, the 50s, 60s, 70s, okay. so that would be um, maybe something you could look into All as right. well. That's good. Um, there's a little bit about her, but again, mm -hmm. it's very interesting these connections. And when I go out and talk, and you know, people like you just did will give me a name, 
And that's how you start mm -hmm. to find and track down people and, and research them because someone knows someone or why don't you consider or look into this and that's always really helpful. Um, but that's how the process works uh, and just doing a lot of the research and um, if you're fortunate enough to meet as I was Ella Baker's grandniece mm -hmm. that's just someone who actually knew the person mm -hmm. and can tell you about them. Because you really want to do justice to the person's life. Yes. And be honest about it. And uh, they won't be able to object. So, but you know, so you want to, you have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that um, little note of ethical responsibility mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're bringing to this. Cause it's so I mean, important. It, it comes through when you read the book. I mean, yes. it's. Good. I love the book. Good, good. <laughs> and we're in our first reprint. Yes, we're in our first <laughs> reprint. So listen, this is a bestseller because when I, when I published Servants of the People and uh, St. Martin's Press published it and I said I was so thrilled to get the letter saying we're interested because I had sent out to 10 publishers. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that to get one, and you're happy about it. I framed the letter, okay? <laughs> it's hanging on the wall at home. And so I said to them as we got into the process, I said, well, how many are you going to run? The <laughs> they said 500. I thought, I said to my sisters, I know 500 people who will buy it. Why is it such a small run? But the truth is, for scholarly books, they're, if they run 500, they expect to have probably half of those <laughs> on the shelf still after many years. So if you can sell that many, and I think that's about how many of the first edition in 2017 you printed. Of, so yes. two years and we have to reprint. They have to reprint. So yes. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So that's great because you do get to go back and correct those little errors that you find and no matter how many times you read it or others and I, I always I a great deal of nervousness when I open the book you're excited to get the book and you see it I'm nervous about reading it because I know I'm going to discover some little error that was overlooked. So I got to correct those in this second printing. So if you have the book, you might still want this one. You might want to buy the second one as well. So I'm just grateful to Sheila and the Office of Archives and History for all you've done to make this a wonderful oh, experience. I love designing this book. Well, it's I learned while wonderful. I was doing and there were moments in there that I just was overwhelmed with emotion. Mm -hmm. I closed mm -hmm. the door. Yes. You know. <laughs> yes. And, you know, composed myself afterwards. Thank you. I was like, wow, this Thank is. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Justice. Yes. Well, can I have to ask a question? Oh, of course. Of, of you, Sheila, in terms of designing um, the book, you say a little bit about. Can you say a little bit about your process and maybe some of the things that inspired you to um, pull together the images that you did? Because it's also a beautifully visual. It's a beautiful oh, visual thank thing, you. too. So the first thing that I was thinking about is this is a young author's book. And as far as designing anything, I have to read and become informed of the content because the content informs the design. Uh, and then after that, I was looking at the uh, more of the content, and I have to thank a colleague, Annie Miller here. Uh, there are sections within this book uh, talking about uh, tenant farmers mm -hmm. and uh, the 19th Amendment and women's voting rights, um, how the the voting process even occurs. Uh, I was, there's another book prior to this that has certain features and uh, I was talking with Annie about it and I said, this book doesn't have this in here. What can we, what can I do about this? And Annie took some of the manuscript and she said, you know, you could talk about this, 
the Harlem Renaissance, you could talk about mm -hmm. this. So uh, it was a collaborative effort. So I, there you go. <laughs> and yeah. let me tell you about this cover. It has a wonderful backstory. <laughs> um, I was looking, when I came to talk uh, about the book after it had been accepted, and I was told there would be 30 images that they wanted to have in, mm -hmm. and that I would be responsible for getting some. <laughs> Although I must say the Office of Archives and History, oh, they did. They really researched. I would submit some, and the Library of Congress is so it's wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, but I thought 30, okay. Well, I went online and, you know, you put in Ella Baker. Well, this image came up. Now, the thing about online, those images, the resolution is not uh, high enough mm -hmm. for printing. Mm -hmm. So you can't just take something mm -hmm. off of the internet. You've got to, and you want to get permission, everything you got to get permission for. And, um, I saw this and I liked that and I said, okay, I contacted uh, Robert Shetterly and he has this whole series called People Who Tell the Truth, mm -hmm. one of which Ella Baker. <clears throat> and this was 2015 and I said, I'd like to use it in uh, the book somewhere. I was thinking inside and you ask, I'd like permission, what's it going to cost, so forth. <clears throat> and he said, uh, it won't, I'm not going to charge you, you can use it. And he gave us the line that we have in there that credits. He said, this is what I'd like you to have. And it was about uh, people who tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So we put that in verbatim. <clears throat> and this is 2015. He said, my daughter-in-law is working on a book about black women mathematicians. And it will mm -hmm. be coming out at some point and I think she would be interested in this. And I thought, black women in math, I'm probably not interested in her book. <laughs> but I hope she'll be interested in mine. <laughs> well, guess what? Margot Lee Shetterly, uh -huh. Hidden Figures, uh -huh. is his daughter-in-law. Wow. Yes. And who, now it gets even better. <laughs> because Greensboro, the library, every other year in the odd year has one city, one book. <clears throat> and in 2017, it was Hidden Figures. And they try desperately, if they can, to get the author to come. Margot Lee Shetterly came. Uh, Sheila mentioned I had been... I, rotated off last year, the board of the Friends of the Greensboro mm -hmm. Public mm -hmm. Library. So the director of the library said to me, we got Margot Lee Shetterly to come. She was going to be at uh, Dana Auditorium on Guilford, the Guilford College campus. Would you moderate a conversation with her? <laughs> no, really. So I got to interview her for that program. Wow. Now she is also unassuming. She was so wonderfully <laughs> gracious. She was, and it was one of the best interviews because she was, not because I was so good, but because she was so good. So I got to meet her and um, her husband. I've not met her father-in-law, <laughs> but I met her, her husband and I met her. But I think if he had known it was going to end up on the cover, because Sheila uh, sent me two images. She sent me this one and one of Ella Baker at an older age. This yes, one. this yeah. one. And she said, which do you like? And I thought for this book, I'd love this one. So, you know, we selected that. But I've used this, we used it on the cover. Because if you're going to use it inside, if people are giving you permission, they probably charge you one price for inside. If it's going to be on the cover, and it, how many will you run, all mm -hmm. of that figures into what the, the price is. But we used it for the cover. I have made business cards and it, bookmarks as well <laughs> using that image. And it is, it's, I just love it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's wonderful. So that's the back story with that. Any other questions? Um, the book is for sale for cash or um, check, but if you would like to um, buy one today, Sheila will be able to do that. But can we please give a big round of applause to Dr. Williams and Sheila and Dr. Thank Johnson. You. Thank this you. Was, Thank the program you. was phenomenal. Um, and we will be doing signings of the book if you would like to. Um, that's it. And we'll be over Thank here you. in the back of the library. And even if you don't buy a book, feel free to take a bookmark. There's some There's over some there. Up there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to do that. And if you want to buy it uh, at a later date, you can go to uncpress.org. UNC Press distributes our books. So thank you for coming out, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.